Welcome to this satsang. Satsang means fellowship with truth. Questions were submitted that will be answered using the counsel given by our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda in his teachings of Self-Realization Fellowship. For those of you who are new to SRF, besides referring to Paramahansa Yogananda as our Guru, we also call him Guruji and Paramahansaji. In India, G is a respectful suffix. And we also call him master because he was a master of himself. He had complete control over his body and mind, which allowed him to become one with God. So let's start with our first question. I would like some concrete ideas about how to serve others. At times, I have given too much in time and effort only to burn out. At other times, I feel I'm not always quite present enough to connect with others in a meaningful way for them. How can one be serviceful to others and stay in balance? I work full time and love to give, but I sometimes tip the balance scale. Wanting to serve is a beautiful expression of the soul, and the more our soul awakens, the more we have that desire to serve and help others. But balance is important. So we look at what is balance. Paramahansaji said to develop ourselves physically, mentally, and spiritually. Because it's when all aspects of our life are in balance that we succeed on the spiritual path. If we become too outwardly active, then we become restless and we forget God. But if we become too inwardly absorbed, we can neglect those experiences we need in order to grow, and we can become selfish. Each one of us has specific responsibilities and circumstances in our life. So balance will look different for each one of us. We want to ask ourselves, what does balance look like for me so that I have time for my spiritual practices, a little time for relaxation, recreation, and that I don't get burned out. So we think about what makes service meaningful when we offer it to God and Guru. We're not doing it for ourselves, not for any personal gain, and not for any praise or recognition. When we make ourselves an instrument that they can use, that God and Guru can flow through in whatever way they want to and not according to our will. Those who live near a temple, a center, or a meditation group know that there's various ways you can serve there. And those of you who are Kriyabans can contact the Voluntary League of Disciples. Many devotees around the world are serving in a variety of capacities through the VLD. I spoke with a woman not too long ago who has two children under the age of three who are very lively, and along with her other responsibilities, she is quite busy, but she really wanted to serve. And so once a week, she reads from the SRF teachings to two blind devotees over the phone, and she said it gives her such joy because she sees how much it means to them and that she found a way she could serve from home with fits in her current situation. Now, we may think of serving only in a physical sense, but there are many forms of service. Paramahansaji said, you can help others mentally by giving comfort to the sorrowful, courage to the fearful, divine friendship and moral support to the weak. Each thought and action emanates a vibration. And when that vibration is spiritual, it reaches out and can help others. It can manifest itself as being understanding, compassionate, really listening to another person, reassuring them. These are gifts of the heart and a beautiful form of service. Dayamata and Anandamata were two early close disciples of Paramahansaji. 
Diamato was president of SRF for over 55 years. And Anandamata, who was her sister, once said, we always want to turn others' minds to the highest. So what is the highest service we can give? Dayamata shared that Paramahansaji often said, change yourself and you will change thousands. Change yourself and you will change thousands. Real service means we make ourselves instruments that God can flow through. So to serve spiritually, first and foremost, means that we deepen our spiritual life by meditation, study and applying the teachings, by bringing God into our daily life, into our experiences. One result of that is that we can become a living reflection of the Guru's teachings. We're peacemakers. We're positive. We care about not just those who are closest to us, but we care about everyone. We become a force for good in this world. Paramahansaji said, whenever you do something for someone else without any selfish motive, you have stepped into the sphere of Christ consciousness. Think of that. You have stepped into the sphere of Christ consciousness. Prayer. Deep, sincere prayer is a powerful form of service. Because we don't necessarily see the result of our prayers, we don't realize their impact. Dayamata said, by changing ourselves through spiritual living and communion with the divine, we automatically radiate vibrations of peace and harmony that do much to counteract the negative effects of inharmonious living. Thus, as a channel for the healing power of God, prayer for others is one of the highest services we can offer. Prayer for others is one of the highest services we can offer. Scientific prayer strikes at the root cause of the world's suffering, the wrong thought patterns of mankind. This is a tremendous service because we are helping on the deepest level to bring about change. Diamanta concluded, through participation in the worldwide prayer circle, each of us can help in the most effective way possible to bring lasting peace and healing to the world and to any in need of aid. So no matter what our circumstances are, we can always pray. And the world needs it so much. Think of the what the world can be if everyone sincerely prayed for the well-being of all. Our next question. Often devotees find themselves in difficult marital situations. I have heard monastics speak about the value of sticking it out and using these adverse situations to see how we might change ourselves. However, I understand that Master was not always opposed to divorce. Yet I think many devotees believe that staying in marriage is the only spiritual option, and those who divorce are often haunted by guilt and a sense of failure. When God created us, he made each one of us a unique soul unlike any other. And so when two souls come together in marriage, no two marriages are the same. We should never compare ourselves to anyone else or one marriage to another marriage because each has its own journey. Paramahansaji explained, we come into this world to learn. We are in school and all of our experiences are opportunities in order for us to grow. That includes marriage. In many situations in life, if things don't go well or the way we want them to, we can leave the job, move to another location, change our friends. 
But in marriage, there is a commitment. Paramahansa Ji said, it is a sacred commitment before God, a vow to God in the other soul. Marriage has a divine purpose for unconditional friendship to elevate human love into divine love, where both spouses want the highest for the other. However, that takes ongoing effort from both spouses. A marriage doesn't sustain itself. We need to keep making that effort. They have to work as a team to have it work. They have to want, among other things, to be true friends, to be harmonious, to be loyal, to trust, to love. If one or more of these foundational stones of a marriage begins to break down, then the focus comes away from being a couple. What was what we need, we want, becomes what I need, I want. We don't think in terms of being married anymore. Now, marriage counseling can help if each spouse is willing to look at what they need to change and not what they think their spouse needs to change. If each one can meet the other halfway, if they can accept one another and love one another as they are and not as they think the other should be. Every marriage has its own challenge and marriage counseling can help to see what is the root cause behind the outer negative behavior? And what are the steps that can help to heal and rebuild that marriage? Sometimes one spouse is more willing than the other to work on improving themselves. And that individual will certainly gain by it. But there can be a misconception that to be spiritual means that I accept everything from my spouse, no matter what it is. And that's not true. Some time ago, I spoke with a woman who, she worked full time, her husband didn't work, and when she wasn't at work, he demanded that she be at home. He controlled the finances, she wasn't allowed to have friends, she could only go to the market, and he was verbally abusive. Now for a very long time, this woman believed that this was her karma and she had to accept it. But her husband's behavior got more and more severe and finally she left him. But she felt she had failed, she felt such guilt, and she felt she had broken her marriage vow. She shouldn't feel that way. He had broken his marriage vow. That was not a marriage. In marriage, both partners recognize the other as their equal. We are all souls. There is a give and take. There is support. When there is destructive behavior and that individual refuses to acknowledge it or try to change it, remaining in that relationship means to continue deepening those negative habit patterns. Paramahansa Ji said, in certain situations, yes, it is better to separate. An individual once asked him, do you believe in divorce? And he said, I don't believe in divorce. But on the other hand, I don't believe in two people staying together, torturing each other for the rest of their lives. I believe they should make every effort to understand each other. They should make every effort to recover that first bloom of love they felt when they wanted to get married. If after trying sincerely, they still cannot live together in harmony, then it is better that they do separate, amicably, if possible. Now you see how he said, they should try. They should try, not just one, both. 
sticking it out without any constructive, positive change does not benefit either spouse. The same harmful mental and emotional patterns just keep repeating themselves. If the marriage ends, but sincere effort was made, one should not feel guilty or that one failed. Remember, God is not judging you. He loves you with a love that is hard to comprehend in this world. He simply wants us to use our experiences as stepping stones to develop wisdom and draw closer to him. He is eternally yours, and there is nothing you could ever do that could make him stop loving you or stop wanting you. Nothing. Next question. I have gotten into a terrible habit. As soon as I sit down to meditate, I get drowsy and fall asleep. Most often, I don't even realize I'm dozing off. I know that Master speaks very strongly about overcoming sleeping in meditation. I have tried so many times, but it is already so ingrained that I seem unable to break it. I am in despair. How can I stay awake and alert in meditation? Please help. Well, good for you that you recognize it, because this is a common problem, and often devotees are not aware that they're sleeping in meditation. I remember that there was a woman who prided herself in needing only three to four hours of sleep a night. And she would attend the group meditations. And before the opening prayer would even end, she would be fast asleep and sleep throughout the whole meditation. And this happened in every meditation. And she was convinced she was meditating. So recognizing that you are dozing off and being humble enough to ask for help in overcoming it makes you receptive to God's help in conquering it. So when you think of what is needed to meditate effectively, falling asleep in meditation is an indication that the body wants rest. In today's world, many people are trying to do too much. So first look at your day-to-day activities. If throughout the day you are, things are hectic, you are racing from one thing to another, you're under stress, you don't have a moment to stop and relax, this creates, this is very draining, creates tension. It's, it's a strain on the nervous system. It has an accumulative effect on the body and mind and makes it more difficult to meditate. So what we need to ask ourselves is, what is essential for me to do? Are these real essentials? And we shouldn't just look at what we need to exclude, but also what do we need to include? If our life is balanced, reasonably balanced, we won't feel a need to fall asleep in meditation. So we look at the physical. Surveys show that a majority of Americans are not getting enough sleep. For many, the one time they stop and try to relax is when they go to bed. And so we sit down to meditate, we stop and try to relax, and the body thinks it's time to go to sleep. Interiorizing in meditation requires energy to concentrate on the meditation techniques, to deepen that awareness of God's presence. And we won't have that if we're exhausted. So in the evening, try to avoid being on the computer or tablet. It creates stimulation. See if you can avoid having a large meal in the evening, which can make us drowsy. Do something that's relaxing. And when you go to bed, you're laying there, do a mental check to see if your body is tense. If we fall asleep tense, throughout the night we are burning energy and we can wake up in the morning feeling exhausted. 
So if you're feeling tense, then double inhale and tense your whole body. Double exhale and relax. Do it several times until you feel your body's completely relaxed. Mental. Stress, worries, nervousness, anxieties, they all create tension and burn up a lot of energy. The mind is wanting to relax. It wants to let go. And the mind and the body are connected. So every once in a while, use an affirmation on peace, on calmness. Think one thought at a time. Don't let thoughts crowd in on you. It creates nervousness. Practice the energization exercise before you meditate. When we really concentrate when we're doing them, we are bringing all that life force into our body, recharging our body. And also, it, we are using concentration to direct that life force to the body part we are tensing. So we are preparing ourselves for meditation. And then there's other aspects, such as making sure the room isn't too warm. You've got plenty of fresh air. Be in proper meditation posture. Have your spine straight. If we are slouched, we're not getting enough oxygen in our lungs. And keep the attention at the spiritual eye. If our eyes are gently lifted to the spiritual eye, we cannot fall asleep. It's when they drop down, we go into the subconscious, and that's when we fall asleep. Another point is to keep the mind focused. You have your opening prayer. Maybe you read a passage from the teachings. Listen to one of the Ezra chants. Concentrate on one of the meditation techniques. Talking to God. In other words, keep the mind engaged. Don't let it drift. And you might find it helpful to try to have shorter meditations. So they're more concentrated. Then sometimes people train themselves to sit for a long time but their mind is wandering from here to there. And in lesson four of the new SRF lessons, under the auxiliary materials, there is a leaflet called Alertness in Meditation that has several helpful suggestions in it. Last, don't give up. Whether we think we're making progress or not, God is aware of every effort we make, and he blesses each one of them. Paramahansa Ji shared that God says, If they do not become discouraged, even though trampled by a crowd of weaknesses or distractions, or bad habits, or restless thoughts, but keep calling soulfully, silently, or shouting for help, then without fail, I will come to their rescue. This is God speaking to you, that his message is for you. Next question. My husband and I always thought we would have a child. But now that we are deeply committed to the SRF path and meditation, we are not so sure. Our parents and other relatives are pressuring us. But we wonder if we really want to devote 20 plus years of our life to bring up a child when we could use all that time for meditation. What is the right attitude for us to take? It's good that you're reflecting deeply on this. Mernalini Mata, late president of SRF, was a close disciple of Paramahansa Ji, and he trained her to edit his writings. And one time she said, everything is trying to tell us something if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. We can gain and learn from everything. Spirituality is not limited to certain activities. I remember Diamato once saying that her day from morning till night was one continuous act for God. Her meditation, whether she was in a board of director meeting, reviewing finances, whatever it was, she offered it to God. 
And in his book, The Practice of the Presence of God, Brother Lawrence said he got to the point where it, there was no difference for him whether he was on his knees in the chapel or among his pots and pans in the kitchen. God is found in the heart and is meant to be expressed and experienced in every aspect of life. So being committed to the spiritual path can occur whether you have a child or not. Let's look at each briefly. Having children. Souls continuing on their journey to God benefit by being born to parents who are sincerely seeking God. It provides them a spiritual environment to grow up in. And being a parent doesn't take away the opportunities to grow spiritually. In fact, it provides many. Sacrifice, selflessness, patience, unconditional love, being understanding. Being able to see the world through the eyes of someone who's not in the same place as you are. All of these are necessary qualities to find God. I knew a woman who, she grew up in the SRF teachings and she went to all the youth programs and Sunday school and teen group and she loved Master. And then when she came, became a young adult, she went out in the world and she got absorbed in, in the world and she lost interest in seeking God. And she told me she became really unhappy and she found herself becoming more and more selfish as she was trying to make herself happy. Then she met a wonderful young man, and they married and became very serious about the spiritual path. And then they had a child, and they said it completely changed their lives. It expanded their love for others. And they said it was a great blessing for them to have a child. Now, not having children... I know many couples who decided not to have children, and they feel great satisfaction and fulfillment in serving Guruji's work. And many of them feel that the SRF spiritual family is their family. They feel no need or desire to expand their own personal family. An interesting thing, too, is that the majority of those who serve in our programs for youth do not have children themselves. So we look at meditation versus activity. The purpose of life is to find God. The experiences we have provide us those opportunities to grow spiritually and find Him. We may not progress from long hours of meditation if we are not having those outer experiences that help us to overcome the ego, which is necessary in order for us to deeply interiorize in meditation. Paramahansaji's teachings is a path of moderation. He said, a balanced approach in the world of activity and meditation leads more quickly to God. We progress more when we spiritualize what we do just like Diamata did. So whether you have a child or not doesn't hinder or quicken your journey back to God. It's what we become inside that determines that. So this is your decision. It shouldn't be based on what your parents or other family members or others think you should do. Look at the various aspects involved with having a child having a stable home environment. Look at your jobs, your finances, the physical strength and energy you both have. What type of schooling, the level of responsibilities, how much freedom, independence versus oversight you would give. Think about how these things make you feel and then openly talk together as a couple. You may find that these help you to discover more about yourselves and how to move forward. And a very important aspect, too, is to include God in this decision. At the end of your meditations, ask Him for His guidance. 
Aligning ourselves with his will is the quickest way we get back to God. Next question. I find myself wanting to rebel against our guru, just as I did as a teenager and rebelled against my parents. I suspect a lot of people can relate to this question. Sometimes I feel stifled by all his requests and guidance. I don't know if I have a question, but I sure could use your help with this ongoing problem. So we think about what is the purpose of the guru in our lives. At some point, our souls called out deeply, wanting to be reunited with God. And God responded by selecting and sending a God-realized guru to lead us out of delusion. God chose Paramahansaji to be our guru. We need the guru because we can't do it on our own. Delusion is too strong. Guruji said it's 25% effort of the devotee, 25% blessing of the guru, and 50% grace of God. This is true for everyone. Now, we can know this intellectually and still feel rebellious. So we think about what is it that's rebelling. It's not the soul. The soul responds to divine law, responds to that inner, higher vibration, naturally wants to abide by it. But we have become accustomed to identifying with the ego, and it's the ego that's rebelling. The ego wants to decide based on likes and dislikes, based on habits that we've become accustomed to. And even though some of those are harmful, because we are used to them, we listen to them. When we realize the ego promises happiness, but only keeps us bound in reincarnating and causes unhappiness, we want to free ourselves from its grip. It doesn't mean it becomes easy, but we start to understand that rebellion prevents us from being able to feel the love, the blessings that God and Guru have for us and that our souls crave. The Guru is a channel of God. Guruji found God, and he willingly became his pure instrument to help us so we can also find God. The Guru is always that direct link to God. He's continually with us. He doesn't just periodically check in. When we accept the Guru, it's not one-sided. He promises to guide and help and be with us until we are liberated. That's quite a promise. And he knows what we want. He knows how strong delusion is. And the longer that we're on the path, the more we start to realize how much the Guru does for us and that these are tangible, ongoing expressions of his love for us. And he does much more than we're aware of. Now, as teens, when we rebel against our parents, it's because we think, well, they don't understand me. And so they don't know what I need. I know what I need. Well, this is just a way to justify doing what we want. And as adults, we can do the same thing with the guru. But as I mentioned, the guru knows what we want, but he also knows what we need. And we can't know what we need because this realm is a realm of delusion, this physical plane. We have been following our own way for many, many incarnations. And Guruji is trying to break that cycle for us, but he can't do it unless we help him. The only relationship with Guruji 
that our souls will be satisfied with is one of complete love, trust, and aligning our will with his will, which is wisdom, because his will is one with God's will. Gyanamata was one of Paramahansaji's earliest, most advanced disciples, and they said of her, Gyanamata was one of the first Westerners who clearly grasped the spiritual importance, value, and intimacy of this sacred bond, the guru-disciple relationship. Think of that, the intimacy of this sacred bond. It's the most beautiful relationship we could imagine. That relationship that is between just you and your guru. The more we develop it, the more important it becomes to us. Throughout his writings, Guruji talks about the joy in God. When we open our hearts to him, he is able to fill it with that love and joy of God. The guru didn't need to come. Nothing he did was for himself. He did it for you. He did it for me. He left the blissful realm of God and came to this troubled world to help us. There's a story of two men who decided they were going to seek paradise and never give up until they found it. And so they set out. And they spent years going through so many things trying to find paradise. And one of them finally got discouraged and wanted to quit. And the other one said, no, we must go on. And so they continued many more years and all their challenges and difficulties. And then the other one got discouraged and said, we're never going to find paradise. But his friend kept encouraging him, and they continued. And then they came to this tall mountain, very steep, and they couldn't even see the top of it. And they started to climb. And it was the most difficult thing they'd ever come across. And they would fall, and they kept trying and climbing, and they went through so much pain and suffering. And with a supreme effort, they finally got to the top. And there it was, paradise. And one just ran down into the valley, just enveloped in this joy and bliss of God, so happy. And his friend was looking at him, smiling. And then he glanced over his shoulder, and he looked back at his friend. And he said, you go ahead into paradise, my friend. I will go back and show others the way. That's the guru. In his poem, God's Boatman, we get a glimpse of how much the guru is willing to do for us. Oh, I will come again and again, crossing a million crags of suffering. With bleeding feet I will come, if need be a trillion times, so long as I know one stray brother is left behind. I want thee, O God, that I may give thee to all. These are not empty words. The Guru only spoke truth, and he's speaking them to you. Whenever you want to rebel against your Guru, remember, he loves you and will always be there for you, helping you, guiding you. When you lift one hand up to him, he will drop both of his down to lift you up. His grace is endless. So now we have a little time to practice an affirmation and have a little guided meditation. When we practice an affirmation, we are affirming a truth. 
And when we say it with conviction, with concentration, it enables it to penetrate deeply into our consciousness. We want to keep all negative thoughts out. Allow ourselves to become absorbed in the words and what they mean. And so we start out by getting in meditation posture, spine straight, shoulders back. Make sure that your body's relaxed to be able to really focus within. We don't want the life force locked in the muscles. Allow yourself to relax more and more. We'll start out saying the affirmation, gradually making it softer and softer until we take it inside. We're just mentally affirming it into our meditation, enveloping ourselves in it deeper and deeper. So let's lift the gaze to the point between the eyebrows, the spiritual eye. With closed eyes, repeat after me. I am submerged in eternal light. It permeates every particle of my being. I am living in that light. The divine spirit fills me within and without. I am submerged in eternal light. It permeates every particle of my being. I am living in that light. The divine spirit fills me within and without. I am submerged in eternal light. It permeates every particle of my being. I am living in that light. The divine spirit fills me within and without. I am submerged in eternal light. It permeates every particle of my being. I am living in that light. The divine spirit fills me within and without. I am submerged in eternal light. It permeates every particle of my being. I am living in that light. The divine spirit fills me within and without. I am submerged in eternal light. It permeates every particle of my being. I am living in that light. The divine spirit fills me within and without. I am submerged in eternal light. It permeates every particle of my being. I am living in that light. The divine spirit fills me within and without. I am submerged in eternal light. It permeates every particle of my being. I am living in that light. The divine spirit fills me within and without. I am submerged in eternal light. It permeates every
Peace. Amen. Did you notice how many times during the satsang I said God loves you? If there's one thing to remember, it's that most important truth. He loves you unconditionally, eternally. He doesn't care about the flaws, the weaknesses, what our status is in the world, what we've accomplished outwardly. He wants one thing from us, our love. May you always feel that sweet divine presence guiding you and blessing you.